What's going on guys? Uh, let's do a lecture on the integumentary system. This would be part of test two. Alright, a brief introduction. So the integumentary system contains not just the skin, but all of its major accessory glands, uh, your hair, your nails, all of this. All of this is going to be considered skin, or let me rephrase, parts of the integumentary system. Now the integumentary system itself is quite large, uh, mounting to about 7% of the body by weight, and lots of surface area, and the, the thickness here of the skin is quite variable in fact. Uh, so certain areas like your cheeks, uh, the undersides of your arm are quite thin, and uh, some areas like the bottoms of your feet can be very thick indeed, so it's quite variable. Uh, the skin, the hair, the nails are a very important part of any physical examination. These can be used to diagnose a whole host of problems from mineral deficiencies to liver issues to kidney issues, you name it. Uh, and the skin is very vulnerable, so the, the fact that your skin is your most exterior covering means that it's um, exposed to a lot of potential problems, and as a result of this, uh, your skin tends to have a lot of medical interventions. So, yeah. Thanks to the skin for all that it does. Now, speaking of the skin and what it does, there are a number, a number of functions here. And uh, the first and foremost amongst these would be protection. So the skin is a wonderful biological barrier. That is the first thing to think about here, folks. The skin is a wonderful, wonderful biological barrier. Um, this is going to keep out all sorts of pathogens. Think about any time you've had a cut or something, the, the chance of it becoming infected is vastly increased when you have a cut or damage to the skin. If the skin is intact, uh, your chance of having some sort of infection is very, very limited indeed. Now, the skin not only protects us from things uh, like bacteria or viruses or what have you, but the skin also protects us from uh, a variety of other things. So, for instance, your skin produces melanin. Uh, melanin is the UV protectant for our body. Okay. The reason that we produce melanin in the skin is because melanin can uh, serve to protect underlying tissues, underlying cells, underlying nuclei from damage from ultraviolet radiation. And it works very well at this, all right? Uh, very, you know, this thing all across all of humanity. Let's see, keratinization for toughening the skin to handle abrasion. Uh, the skin has, yeah, macrophages. Let's talk more about Langerhans cells. The skin will also have Langerhans cells, which we'll be talking about a little bit later on. And uh, these are going to be very good um, cells at defending us versus bacterial invaders specifically. Okay, and, and I'll be showing you these. All right, the skin has metabolic functions. Key amongst these, the skin is a key part of the synthesis of vitamin D. Vitamin D being a steroid hormone, this is um, finalized in the skin. And what will happen is uh, this hydrocarbon, this vitamin D, is going to be used by the body to assist in the uptake of calcium from the intestinal tract. So the reason that we need vitamin D is so that we can absorb calcium from our intestines and thus have strong bones. You can drink milk all day long if it doesn't have vitamin D in it and to stay inside, limiting vitamin D synthesis, and uh, you, you, will, you will not have a functioning skeleton. Right? You have to have vitamin D as well as calcium. So this is super important, super important. The skin's production of vitamin D really matters. Sensation. So obviously we can touch, we can feel, we can uh, experience things through our exterior surface. Uh, your skin has what's referred to as mystrous and psenian corpuscles. Uh, these are two separate types of corpuscle, which are the main touch receptors. Uh, your skin does indeed serve a role in excretion, be that sweat or sebaceous excretions. And uh, I will also point out that your skin can serve a role in excreting certain uric components as well. And what else do we have? All right, body temperature regulation, obviously. So your body temperature is in part governed by producing uh, sweat from the skin and or sending excess blood into the skin to radiate heat, or alternatively pulling blood out of the skin to hold heat in the core of the body. The skin works as a radiating system for your body. Now, last but not least, uh, nonverbal communication. How many times... Have you seen someone and just known if you were going to get along or not get along? How many times have you ran into someone you know and you could tell immediately how they were feeling? You know, what was going on in their minds? 
The skin is a wonderful, your exterior covering, I should say, is a wonderful tool for nonverbal communication, be that with other humans or even uh, even animals for that matter. Like, this is my little dog, Archie. He's amazing. And here he is when I walked in a room to get something and cut the light on and he had been asleep and he looked at me like I was the most terrible person on the planet. I immediately turn the light off and left. I figure come back later after he gets a nap. And uh, here he is um, upon asking if he wants a treat. Okay, and then, hey boy, you want something to eat? And he's like, yes, yes, that sounds like a great idea. It's very obvious how he is feeling just based off of his physical appearance. And uh, we can't, you know, downgrade the, the importance of that, of being able to look at someone and identify their trustworthiness. In fact, um, you have a center in your brain whose sole role is to uh, identify trustworthiness based off of facial features. It's a pretty neat concept. Next we have the layers of the skin. So this is going to start with the epidermis. The epidermis is the stratified squamous. This is um, going to be a layer for protection. This is the shield. You have this upper surface that's mostly dead cells, uh, heavily keratinized. There are actually toxins produced that are released here. Like, this is a bad place to live for most of anything. And uh, this layer is non-vascularized, as I say here, meaning that there's no blood flow to it. Ergo, this is just a really tough place for like a bacteria or something to set up shop and survive. Uh, so the outer layer of skin is a wonderful barrier to keep things out. The dermis is the main thickness of the skin. This is the vast majority. This is all this down here. Uh, the dermis of the skin is this really thick, uh, dense, irregular connected tissue layer. Super strong. When you think about a leather jacket, like this is the leather jacket. This is the main thing you think about, especially with a suede leather jacket. And inside of the skin here in the dermis, this is heavily vascularized, and you find all the major glands of the skin. You find the hair follicles producing hair. Uh, you find the Meissner's and Pacinian corpuscles. Like, all of that fun stuff is going to be located in this area. Uh, this is where the work of the skin gets done. And then below that is the hypodermis. Now, the hypodermis is from this layer down. Uh, this is basically a layer of fat, underlying fat. It is a cushioning area, if you will, and also there will be some layers of connective tissue here that help to hold the uh, layers above down to underlying musculature or bone or what have you. So very important. Three layers of skin. Epidermis, dermis, and hypodermis. Now there are distinctive cell types found in the skin. Let me just preface this by saying there are indeed stem cells that give rise to all the rest of these, especially early on. Uh, I will not focus on this, rather. I will focus on this side of things. Okay, here we go. Uh, keratinocytes are the main skin cell. Keratinocytes make up the vast majority of the skin in its entirety. I don't think I have a percentage on here, but probably 90-95% of the skin is keratinocytes. Uh, what these do is they produce the protein keratin, which toughens them up, and uh, the, keratin the keratinocytes are produced at the very bottom layer of the skin. They grow upwards until they outreach the um, um, connective tissue's nutritive supply, and then they begin to dry out and die. Once they die, they eventually harden and then flake off the surface. And uh, boy, let me tell you, you release lots of these dead skin cell flakes just constantly constantly. In fact, the skin has about a 25 to 45 day keratinocyte turnover from the moment they're produced to the moment they leave. So between 25, like for instance, the bottom of your arm, every 25 days that skin is completely, completely replaced. So these are uh, very mitotically active and interestingly the keratinocytes in this area uh, have lots of desmosome connections between them and that's why they have this kind of stretched out appearance, almost like there are ropes connecting all of it together uh, because there are desmosomes in those locations giving it what uh, early histologists would say was a spiky appearance. It appears very sharply edged, spiky if you will. Um, that's a classic keratinocyte uh, concept. Yeah. Uh, next are the melanocytes. And you can see gorgeous melanocytes down here. This, again, a person with a darker skin coloration can see all this melanin being produced in the very lowest layers of the skin. Uh, fun fact, we all have the same basic number of melanocytes. It's just some of us express it more or less 
Uh, so it's all the same basic concept. Now the melanin itself is in fact produced in the lowest layer of the skin, right next to the underlying connective tissue where it gets its nutritive value, uh, but the, me the melanin doesn't do its job there. But what will happen is the melanocytes actually have these little feeler arms that reach up into the second layer of skin here, and they deposit the melanin on these cells, and the melanin forms little umbrellas in the cell over the cellular nuclei. And it's a little complicated, but the idea is, and you can look in here and you can see that the melanin makes up little hats that sit on top of the cells. The goal is that as ultraviolet radiation comes in, it's going to hit that melanin and be broken up so that it doesn't damage the underlying nuclei. Okay? What the melanin does is prevent the uh, ultraviolet radiation from damaging the nuclei of the cells. And it works. works very well. Um, yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. So, good enough. Good enough. Let's go here. Tactile or Merkel cells. You'll also hear this referred to as a system called a Merkel disc. Uh, Merkel cells, Merkel discs, what these are are very simple touch receptors. Okay, very, very simple touch receptors. These Merkel cells, uh, they're basically like binary. They either are active or they are not active. The gist of this being that um, you are either touching something or you're not touching something. You can tell nothing else about it. They are quite binary and very simple. These are the most uh, closely associated with the surface uh, of any of your touch receptors. And they're very simple. Okay, very, just very, very simple. By comparison to Langerhans cells, uh, Langerhans cells, as shown here, are white blood cells. These are unique in that they do not come from the skin. All the other cells that we've been talking about here, they all arise in the skin. Langerhans cells come from the bone marrow, as do all white blood cells. And uh, they migrate to the skin and move up into the second layer of skin and set up shop so that anything coming in, the Langerhans cells can pick them up and uh, attack and destroy them if at all possible. They're, they're really fascinating. They have all these projections that stick off, and you can see some of the projections, for instance, there. Uh, as feelers, like feeling around to see if there are any, um, well, let's keep this simple, see if there are any cells that have surface markers that uh, identify them as foreign. So imagine you're walking around the woods and the briar hangs your arm or something, kind of pokes you. Uh, that would be attacked primarily, initially, by Langerhans cells to make sure there's nothing there that could potentially hurt you. Now, it's also worthy consideration to discuss the layers of the skin in terms of what's referred to as thick skin versus thin skin. And I, I sort of already uh, came up and, and discussed this with you whenever we were first starting. Your skin varies in thickness. Okay, You have very thin skin, for instance, on your cheeks, and you have much, much thicker skin on your palms and soles. And in fact, we name the types of skin based off of this. There's thick skin, which you find on your palms and soles, and it's very different. Very different. Versus thin skin that's found everywhere else. Okay, thick skin versus thin skin. Um, do I want to talk about this now? Let's just go ahead and talk about this now. Uh, your thick skin found on the palms and soles, if you look at your hands, the palm of your hand, you'll notice a few very different concepts here. One is your fingerprints, and we'll talk about what that is in a little while. But two is they are uh, devoid of hair. And that's because thick skin does not support hair follicles. Right? Thin skin does. So thin skin supports uh, uh, far more complexity, including hair follicles and the muscles associated and all sorts of fun stuff. So there's thick skin and there's thin skin. Now what makes this thick is the very top layer is super thick. Bottom layer, bottom layer, second layer, second layer, third layer, third layer, fourth flaky layer, fourth flaky layer. That flaky layer at the top is just very different in thick skin. Speaking of the layers of the skin, we need to go through and talk about these layers as they have names. Now, there are four to five distinct layers in the skin. Now, that's a weird way to say it. Basically, I will discuss with you four layers of the skin. I will point out the existence of the fifth, but some texts don't even include it. Okay, I will focus on the four layers of the skin. And those four layers are the stratum basale, the stratum spinosum, the stratum granulosum, and the stratum corneum. 
Okay, we're going to sort of ignore the existence of the stratum lucidum, and I'll, I'll mention why that is in a second. All right, the first layer, the layer at the bottom, obviously, is the stratum basale. Basale. Basale means base layer. The stratum basale, the stratum base layer. Now, the stratum basale is the lowest single layer of cells, and this is the layer of cells where uh, the, the cells are actively dividing. This is the layer of cells where you find melanocytes in the stem cells. So the cells that are growing and developing and doing what they have to do, being mitotic or what have you, even the Merkel discs, they are all in the stratum basale, that lowest layer of cells. Actively mitotic because the stratum basale is closest to the underlying connective tissue where the nutritive supply comes from. Next is the stratum spinosum. Stratum means layer. Spinosum means of spiny cells. Okay, spiny cells. And the reason they look spiny is because of the desmosomes, all right? The desmosomes in here getting at these sharp edges, as you can see. Uh, now, the stratum spinosum, well, let me say this. The stratum basale is where the melanocytes are found, but the stratum spinosum is where the melanin does its job. Let me make sure you understand that. In the stratum spinosum, melanin is there to shield us from UV radiation damaging our underlying tissues. So when we produce melanin, we are producing that melanin for it to do its job in the stratum spinosum. Also in the stratum spinosum, this is where you find Langerhans cells, those protective cells, because this is the last like area of the body where you can still have some nutritive supply because above that the cells all die because there is no nutrition. So these Langerhans cells require nutrition to stay there and live. Ergo, they sit around in the stratum spinosum. Next is the stratum granulosum. Now the stratum granulosum is this one layer right through here. You can see it pretty well here. This dark purple and this dark purple. All right. That is the stratum granulosum, and we call it the stratum granulosum because it has um, uh, keratinohyaline granules and what are called lamellated granules. Keratinohyaline granules basically just give rise to keratin, and lamellated granules release a lipid that acts like a waterproofing agent. Okay, a lipid that acts like a waterproofing agent. Now, let's see what I want to say. On your test, I would probably ask a question like this. I would say... Uh, true or false? The stratum granulosum is called granulosum because it contains melanin granules. And the answer there is false. Okay, We call it the stratum granulosum because of the keratinohyaline and lamellated granules. Uh, keratinohyaline toughening the skin, lamellated granules, the glycolipids there acting as a waterproofing agent. Uh, now, this is very important. The layers below the stratum granulosum are considered living, but the stratum granulosum and everything above it are considered dead. The idea is that if these lamellated granules waterproof the cells, that means they can no longer receive nutrition from the underlying connective tissues. In other words, this is the barrier, and everything above it is dead. You can see that these cells really change. They look quite different. There's the stratum granulosum, and here's all these dead cells above it. Here's the stratum granulosum, and here's all these dead cells above it. Uh, by waterproofing the skin of this area, everything above it is dead. Yeah, that'll work. And let's see, stratum lucidum. So I, I said I didn't really want to talk much about this. This is just a weird effect of thick skin that above the stratum granulosum, you can see this light colored area here. Just ignore its existence. I don't really care uh, anything about the stratum lucidum. So I'm going to say stratum lucidum one more time. Stratum lucidum. And now you will never hear it from me again. Okay? Uh, then... Unless we do it in lab. <laughs> and then there's the stratum corneum. So the stratum corneum is the flaky layer at the top. Uh, it's by far got the highest number of cellular layers by count. And uh, these are basically just little dead bags of keratin. Like there's nothing fancy happening here. They're empty bags of keratin. They are non-palatable. They have very little nutritive supply. They are constantly flaking away. In fact, you shed about 50,000 cells per hour. So in the time it'll take you to listen through this lecture or so, uh, you will have lost about 50,000 cells wherever you're sitting. And uh, this will account to about 40 pounds of dead skin in a lifetime. So if you look around your room, wherever you're at, and you uh, see dust on the walls or on a fan or something, what you're really looking at in all likelihood is your own dead skin. Pretty terrifying. Okay, let's talk about the dermis. 
So in the dermis of the skin, let's see, what do we want to say first? All right, what we have here is two layers. These two layers are the papillary layer, which is the upper small amount here. Let's see, I think it's 20%. I'll have to check. Yeah, I'll have to check in a second, but I think it's the upper 20%. Very thin. Just the very top is called the papillary layer, and we call this the papillary layer because it has dermal papillae. You can see these little bumps in it? Let me check something, folks. Hang on. Yeah, it'll do. You can see these little bumps. This is the papillary layer. These are dermal papillae. That's what we call it, the papillary layer. And then everything below that is called the reticular layer. Uh, so all of this, the, the main thickness of the skin, is the reticular layer of the dermis. Okay. Uh, so first, the papillary layer. Again, this is the layer that is made up of dermal papillae. You can see the dermal papillae, the bumps. These are little finger-like projections that push their way up. What this does is it increases the surface area between the, um, the epidermis and the dermis to facilitate for diffusion of uh, nutrients and, and movement of water and all that fun stuff. So, so basically just increasing the surface area there. And the, uh, the papillary layer is also important because it contains the Meissner's corpuscles. Meissner's corpuscles, as you can see here, these, these small little things, these Meissner's corpuscles, uh, these are touch receptors. And uh, what they do is they sense very delicate touch sensations. Okay, very, very delicate touch sensations. Like I can feel this table and I can feel of the texture, the smoothness of it. I can feel of my phone and I can feel the texture of the buttons. That is Meissner's corpuscles. They, they deal with very delicate touch sensation. Okay, very delicate touch sensation. Now, the uh, papillary layer is also important because on the hands it gives rise to what we call friction ridges or what you probably know of as fingerprints. Fingerprints are basically where the dermal papillae line up and there are little ridges uh, that assist in this, but the concept is that uh, dermal ridges, uh, friction ridges, these are not there for police to be able to identify you. These are for you to have friction on your fingertips so you can pick things up and hold on to them uh, without dropping them. All right, so that is the idea behind these friction ridges. And just for curiosity's sake, if you look at these tiny little openings all through here, little holes, uh, those are openings of sweat glands. So there are sweat glands in the papillary layer. Uh, well, let me rephrase. Let's change the way I'm phrasing that. Uh, there are sweat glands even on the palms of your hands, as you well know if you've ever been nervous and had your palms begin to sweat. All right, and here is the reticular layer. So this is the main thickness of the skin. The reticular layer contains 80% of the dermis. This would be where the hair follicles do their majority of their job. This is where you find uh, the glands of the skin. This is where you find your erector pili muscles that make the hair follicles stand up. This is where you find the larger arterial networks. This is where you find the Pacinian corpuscles. And Pacinian corpuscles deal with what we tend to call deep touch sensations. So if you pick up something very heavy, the weight you feel against your hand, that is from the Pacinian corpuscles. And in extreme situations, with extreme pressure, the Pacinian corpuscles even act in a nociceptive capacity, which is a fancy way of saying that they perceive pain uh, stimulations. They send out pain stimulations. So the reticular layer of the dermis is very important. There is simply a lot going on there. Um, yeah, we can talk about it. Okay, so uh, let's very quickly discuss the concept of tissue repair. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this, so prepare yourselves. In the event you are cut, you know about the basic concepts of what's going to happen to heal that cut. You get a cut, it drips blood, and it slows down, and it stops bleeding, it scabs over. Uh, me and my northern Scottish heritage, I'm, you know, white as a ghost, you can see like a red ring around the area of the wound. And then eventually it'll heal over, the scab will fall off, and you'll have a little scar underneath. So what is happening during all that process? Well, when you cut, get a cut in the area, the body sends out emergency signals and basically calls in for platelets and um, fibers in the blood to pile up and form a blood clot. That's why the blood stops leaving the body. You get a blood clot formed. Uh, once you have clotted the area, uh, that will basically end up weeping out fluid that forms a scab. And then your body will actually grow in 
piles of capillary beds, man. Your body just brings in all kind of capillary beds and surrounds the area of damage to provide higher nutritive supply to the area where the cut is. You ever cut yourself? and it doesn't really bleed or have any kind of problems, and then after a few days it's got a scab and you're doing what you're not supposed to do, you're scratching at it, and then it starts to just bleed everywhere for no apparent reason. Like, man, that never bled, and now it's bleeding all over the place. Like, how the heck does that happen? It's happening because your body grows in all sorts of capillaries to help the area heal. Again, me and my Northern Scottish heritage, that red ring I can see around a wound, what that is, is where the body is grown in capillaries to help the area heal. It's not infection, it's to help you heal up. Um, yes, yeah, so that's restoring the blood supply. Now, as you're healing everything back, your body is thinking to itself, man, he just cut himself right there. You know, maybe he's prone to it. So let's reinforce the area with a bunch of collagen fiber to make it stronger. And that, folks, is a um, scar. So if you look at a scar, again, me and my Northern Scottish heritage, if I kind of pulled my skin tight and I look at a scar, it's got this shiny white appearance. And uh, that is the classic view of collagen fiber. Like if you could see cartilage in your knee, I invite you to pause this video and uh, go on to Google and type in knee cartilage and look at it real knee cartilage. It's like an ultra iridescent shiny white coloration because it's pretty much just collagen. Just collagen. And that is no different from scar tissue. Okay, scars are mostly collagen. Uh, what else do I want to say here? Surface epithelium. Yeah, man. I think that's good enough. I really think that's good enough. Uh, you got to think of scarring as a, uh, a process of learning, if you will. So if you go out in the bright sunlight, and you're exposing yourself to lots of UV radiation, <clears throat> your skin will produce melanin to protect you against that UV radiation. If you go to a gym and you start doing heavyweight workouts all the time, your muscles will get larger to deal with the excess stress you're placing upon them. And if you cut yourself, your body will scar that area to toughen it uh, as an adaptive process, not unlike the other two we just described. Cleavage lines. All right, so uh, as it turns out, your skin is sort of tightly held down to its underlying musculature and connective tissues. You have these big, thick layers of collagen fiber, shown here in red lines, that hold the skin down to the underlying tissues. And this is very obvious. I can come in here and I can pinch up my skin quite easily, all right, like this. But if I come in on the opposing way, it's it's very hard for me to do. I can come here to my palm and I, I can't even pinch the skin up on my palm. I can't do it because the skin is so tightly held down by collagen fiber in these areas. Uh, the reason for this is very simple. You don't want your skin just kind of floating all around the place. You want it tightly held down. This kind of uh, assists with the prevention of blistering, for instance. And this process, this knowledge, is very important when we're doing surgical procedures as well. You may have noticed that you, or someone you know, may have had some sort of a, a surgical, op surgical operation, an operation. And uh, when you look at the scar or how the initial cut was done, it's on some kind of weird angle, like you wouldn't expect it to be the way it is. Neck surgery is the most famous. When people have ne ne uh, neck surgery, they kind of come in at a distinctive, strong angle. Like you see this weird, distinctive angle. The reason that we do this is, if we can cut the body open between the cleavage lines, it'll be self-healing. Okay, the, the cleavage lines will pull the skin back together and keep it uh, tight so that healing is much faster with less scarring, all that fun stuff. Whereas if you come in here and you cut against the cleavage lines, every time the body moves, it's going to pull against the cut and it's going to make it scar over real bad and it's probably not going to heal very fast either. Um, so we use this knowledge in surgical procedures to assist us with making wounds heal more quickly, which is important because it decreases the risk of uh, pathogenic invasion. All right, the evolution of skin color. I mean, how can you discuss the skin without talking about the most conspicuous sign of human variation? And we sort of already bro broached the subject. Uh, we know that the main pigment that runs skin coloration is melanin. We know that's produced by melanocytes. We know that we all have the same basic number of melanocytes. It's just that some of us make more or less of that melanin. And the question herein is why? 
And the answer deals with UV radiation. Now, if I were to ask you why we need to protect ourselves from the sun, your answer, and I know for a fact, would be skin cancer. And you'd be wrong. Skin cancer is not what drives this. It's got no real bearing over it. Uh, you got to go back and think about this in terms of natural selection and Darwinian evolution. Skin cancer affects people when they're in their 40s, 50s, 60s, typically. Much older than uh, reproductive age. Most people reproduce uh, in their 20s or early 30s. And in the distant past, you can expect people to have been re reproducing far earlier than that. Probably mid-teens quite easily. So, skin cancer would have no bearing over their capacity for reproduction, and natural selection tells us that we're all driven by uh, producing fertile offspring. So, what does melanin and UV radiation have to do with fertile offspring? Well, turns out that UV radiation has a pair of adverse effects. It can cause skin cancer, but it, it's got no real bearing over melanin production. What we're worried about is a compound called folic acid. Uh, these are iron constituents that are found in the body. Uh, folate, folate. This material, folic acid, is super important for normal cell division. It turns out that when you have a high amount of folate in the body, a uh, female, which has a high amount of folate in the body, has vastly increased fertility and much, much healthier fetal development. Uh, in fact, if you go and you look at uh, Publix and you look at their prenatal vitamins, you flip it over and look, it's going to have a really high dose of folate in every single caplet. Because uh, if you're taking prenatal vitamins with lots of folate inside of there, that reduces the risk of the vast majority of major birth defects. Like when I say birth defects, the things that come to your mind, those are pretty much eliminated by taking high doses of folate. If you're taking lots of folate, your uh, chance of having high fertility and good fecundity, good fetal development, um, man, it's vastly increased, vastly increased. So what the UV radiation does is it shields folate, folic acid, from being destroyed. UV radiation destroys folic acid, but if you're producing lots of melanin, that melanin will shield the folic acid and prevent its breakdown, thus increasing fertility. That's great. That's a wonderful thing. So think about 150,000 years ago. You're walking around, and if you're getting a lot of sunlight, that's going to be busting up folic acid, and it's going to decrease your risk. Or no, no, wrong, wrong, wrong. You're walking around, uh, UV radiation is busting up your folic acid. That's going to increase your risk of having major, major problems during fertility. Major fertility problems. So what do you do? You produce melanin, and the melanin shields the folic acid increasing your fertility and uh, making for healthier fetal development, reducing the risk of birth defects. So that bears the question. Why don't we all have just like the most melanin production physically possible to completely shield our folic acid, thus increasing our fertility? Why not? And the answer here is very fascinating. UV radiation also has a desirable effect. And its desirable effect is that it assists us with the production of vitamin D, which we must have to absorb calcium. Now, if there's anything you need to understand about, for instance, general fertility, it's that you need a lot of calcium to support fetal skeletal growth. You need a lot of calcium right now to support your general health, okay? So how do you get calcium uh, from your intestinal tract? You have to have vitamin D that's synthesized via UV radiation hitting the skin for you to then absorb that calcium. But if you're producing all the melanin in the world, that's going to shield your underlying tissues from UV radiation and prevent you from making vitamin D. Folks, it's a trade-off. It's a beautiful trade-off. A variant seen across the entire globe the entirety of the homo sapien population of this planet, okay? Doesn't matter where you are. When you look at the equator, generally darker skin complexions. And then as you move away from the equator, lighter skin complexions. And what this has to do with is uh, what's referred to as solar incidence, uh, the way that sunlight hits the planet, okay? When sunlight comes straight in on the planet, boy, this is kind of hard to explain. Uh, when sunlight comes straight in on the planet, it hits check my time. Okay. 
when sunlight comes straight on the planet, it hits and it's got a given thickness of atmosphere to get through. But if sunlight comes in and it hits the edge of the planet, the average thickness that it has to get through is vastly more. Okay? The long story short to this is that sunlight hitting at the equator is far more powerful in terms of UV radiation. Uh, whereas sunlight hitting towards the poles, most of it gets reflected back out into space and very little actually makes it in. So, what the heck does that mean? That means that people living along the equator, regardless of where you are on the planet, okay, doesn't matter where you're from, if you're along the equator, uh, your skin coloration should be a little darker because you're producing more melanin because your ancestors were dealing with way more intensive sunlight so they were trying to shield their folic acid so that they could have healthy babies. That's what this is about. This is about having healthy offspring. Whereas, if you're up towards the poles, if you're from a higher latitude, um, what's happening here is there's not much sunlight coming in to begin with. And because there's not much sunlight, not much UV radiation coming in, you're not really concerned about folate. You, know, you can get all that you want. The sunlight's not going to destroy it. What you're worried about is having appropriate amounts of vitamin D so that you can absorb calcium. So as you go north, you're worried about your vitamin D. When you go towards the equator, you're worried about your um, folic acid storages. And again, when you go south, same concept. Uh, the idea here is you've got to protect your folic acid along the equator and you need vitamin D towards the poles. And that, folks, is what gives rise to human skin coloration. And it's a beautiful story from my perspective. Just a beautiful, beautiful story. Okay, um, a compromise. It's a compromise between having appropriate amounts of vitamin D and protecting folic acid. Darker skin coloration, better at protecting against UV radiation, uh, less capacity for the manufacture of vitamin D. Lighter skin colorations, lower UV radiation protection, but more capacity for the synthesis of vitamin D. Now today, is this a problem? I would really say no. Uh, if you go to a grocery store and you look at uh, the milk or the cheese or the bread or most items of Man, I've got freaking Sunny D, Sunny Delight in there. All of it says enriched with vitamin D. Basically, any food that contains a high calcium storage, uh, we artificially enrich it with vitamin D so that it's um, uh, capable of being absorbed into our intestinal tract. In fact, uh, in North Carolina, my wife and I had two kids when we lived in North Carolina, and they would prescribe new mothers vitamin D supplements. So they'd have to like put a drop of vitamin D in their food every time they had a meal. And uh, it would assist in providing enough calcium for the body so that the kids would be born with a stronger skeletal build for the time. It's a little complicated, but you get my point. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's great. So let me just lay a couple of things on you, and then we're going to move on. So pregnancy and folate. If you are pregnant, you or, let me rephrase, if you're pregnant, if you think you may be pregnant, if you'd like to be pregnant, you need to be taking folic acid. You need to be taking a uh, prenatal vitamin, which can always contains this, because it vastly, vastly decreases the risks of, and I'm going to read to you, neural tube defects, malformations of the spine and skull, brain, spina bifida, and acephaly heart defects, cleft lips, limb defects, urinary tract abnormalities, preterm deliveries, low birth weight, fetal growth retardation, spontaneous abortions, pregnancy complications like placental abruptions, and of course, preeclampsia. Folks, that's the who's who. A lot of these are cut by like 90% when you're taking prenatal vitamins. So take prenatal vitamins if you think you might be or are pregnant. It is very, very, very important. Okay. Uh, three pigments, dread skin color, melanin is the main one. Let, let's talk about tanning. So if we all quit our jobs right now and we decide to go and buy us some land down in Moundville and we plowed the fields and started growing crops, all right, all of our skin tones would change. 
by being outdoors more often and being exposed to UV radiation by working in the fields, our skin, all of us, would get darker. And the reason for this, the reason we tan, all of us, the reason we tan is because the human body picks up all this UV radiation is coming in and says, oh man, we're getting so much uh, sun these days, we better protect ourselves so the body will produce melanin to protect us from that UV radiation. Now, there are two other pigments that also drive skin coloration to some degree. These are keratin and hemoglobin. Not keratin with a K, but keratin with a C. Keratin and hemoglobin. Uh, keratin is something we sequester from some of the foods that we eat, the most famous of which obviously being carrots. Uh, carrots with their orange coloration. If you look here, uh, this is a person whom is a vegetarian and a, a family member whom has uh, a standard diet, if you will. So you can see this orangey hue to the skin. It turns out we store keratin in our stratum corneum. Uh, so the areas where the stratum corneum is thickest, i.e. in thick skin, like your palms, your soles, uh, will take on this more orangey color in some cases uh, when you have a diet high in keratin. Hemoglobin, by comparison, uh, is the oxygen carrier in blood, but it does in fact have a reddish coloration. Your blood has a reddish coloration as a result of hemoglobin, and that's what could give rise to, for instance, this kind of pinkish red color in the skin in this particular case. Um, now, cyanosis is thought of as a bluing of the skin, uh, which is oftentimes a result of a low oxygen condition, and jaundice is a yelling of the skin that we tend to see in newborns. Uh, before their liver is fully uh, capable of, of dealing with some of the pigments that the body's releasing as a result of breaking down red blood cells. It's kind of a long story, but jaundice is a sign of other problems, typically of liver disease, or a liver issue, generally. And uh, then, of course, there's albinism. So albinism is a condition where the body is uh, uh, incapable of producing melanin, and uh, in this situation, you can see the animal's completely white fur. Again, this is a side effect of not having any capacity for the production of melanin. And humans obviously experience this condition as well, uh, which is at least a mild problem uh, because melanin is very important for the function of our eyes as well. So people who are albino tend to have eye issues. Right. Now let's talk about the glands. So in the world of the skin appendages, there are nails, uh, your, your glands of various formats and hair follicles. Let's start off by talking about the glands. And first things first, there are two types of sweat glands. These are the eccrine sweat glands and the apocrine sweat glands. Uh, ex, these are obviously exocrine. I'm sorry, I kind of got ahead of myself there. These are exocrine glands. They, they produce a chemical via exocytosis and release that chemical through a duct. All right, let's go here. All right, excellent. Eccrine glands. Uh, eccrine sweat glands are the general sweat gland of the body. You've got millions of these all over yourself, man. Uh, top of your head to the bottoms of your feet. Like, you've got eccrine glands all over the place. These are the sweat glands that cool you down when you're hot. Uh, these are the sweat glands that um, basically produce a fully liquid water output, okay? So this is going to be like, again, I've got here like 99% water. Uh, they will contain some other chemicals on occasion. So there will be dermocidins inside of this. There, it's a little bit acidic. The idea here is that not only is this going to cool you down, but it can also be antibacterial and antifungal. Uh, these fungi tend not to do well with acidic uh, situations. Now, this is going to be for combating heating, that is a fact, and dealing with emotional sweat. So emotional sweat also involves these eccrine glands. By comparison, uh, there are apocrine glands. Now, first to comment, eccrine glands are a coiled tube that terminate on the skin surface. Apocrine glands. Uh, these are far less uh, numerous, they're pretty rare in the body, only about 2,000, you know, give or take, so far, far less. Um, and... What's interesting about these is what they produce other than just sweat, okay? So they do indeed produce true sweat, but they also do produce a, uh, f certain fats and proteins, 
and this is kind of interesting. The, the secretion itself is odorless, but um, because of the nature of the secretions, this provides a food source for bacteria, and bacteria chowing down on the production of apocrine glands actually gives rise to body odor. So when you smell body odor, what that is is not a scent being produced by a person, but rather a scent being produced by bacteria that are on that person. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. Uh, now, these are confined to certain regions of the body. They are only found kind of underneath the arms and between your legs. And as a result of that, as a result of what they produce, proteins, it's pretty random, uh, we believe these are probably uh, like closet scent glands. These are going to really start cranking after puberty. Uh, they crank up even uh, in more extreme during sexual excitation. Uh, they are higher in production during the fertile phase of the menstrual cycle. We believe these are probably closeted scent glands. So think about like a deer in the woods. How does one deer find another during breeding times? It's all based off of scent. We uh, believe that these are probably vestigial mammalian scent glands that probably don't do quite as much for us these days. Uh, they surely have an effect, uh, but to what degree we are not certain. Yeah. Now, uh, ceruminous, ceruminous glands, which are uh, the glands in the ears, which produce cerumen, which is earwax, and the uh, uh, mammary glands, which we use to produce milk to feed our young, are modifications on the theme of apocrine glands. Um, yeah, that's really good enough for me. Now, let me make one more quick point before I move forward, and that is that eccrine sweat glands terminate on the skin surface. Eccrine glands, these are just good old-fashioned sweat glands. Uh, apocrine glands are only found in thin skin because they have to terminate on a hair follicle, and it's the same story for sebaceous glands. Sebaceous glands also terminate on a hair follicle. Uh, speaking of sebaceous glands, sebaceous glands produce a fluid called sebum, uh, and they do so in holocrine fashion, so this is a little bit different from the excrine glands that we looked at previously. And in essence, what you have to think of is that this produces a lipid. Okay, a lipid, really what it is, is a moisturizing and waterproofing agent, and uh, it is also bactericidal. These also began to function post-puberty. Uh, these actually give rise to pimples, which we'll talk about here in just a second. But let me ask you a question. I assume that at some stage in your life you have been in water, like in a tub bath, for instance, for a prolonged period of time, and your hands and your feet get pruny. You ever notice this? They get wrinkly. Uh, the reason that this happens, one of the reasons this happens, is because you don't have hair on your hands and feet, which means you don't have sebaceous glands on your hands and feet, which means that these uh, parts of the skin do not have as much waterproofing agent as other parts of the skin. It's a little more absorptive. Uh, so that's one of the things about sebaceous glands that are kind of interesting. They are uh, producing a waterproofing and moisturizing agent. And when a sebaceous gland becomes blocked, you may at some stage in your life have, have seen a pimple uh, uh, just arrive out of nowhere and has a hair sticking out of it, that's because the hair, is, the hair follicle itself is where the sebaceous gland is located, and if its opening gets blocked by something, the sebum just builds up inside of there, and you get this oily little pocket, if you will. Now, you do what you're always told not to do, and you squeeze it. If you squeeze it immediately, what you get is this kind of oily goo out of there, and that's clear, or kind of like a, a yellowish tinge, and that's sebum, that is the oil that's produced by the gland. And if you leave it to sit around for a while, it can get infected. If it gets infected with bacterial, um, uh, well, I wouldn't say pathogens, but it gets bacteria in it, uh, what will happen is this will accumulate a white coloration. And if that then oxidizes, uh, it can turn quite dark indeed. It will become a blackhead. Um, so all of these are the same basic concept. Now, if you get the bacterium propriano bacterium acnes, which are quite extreme by comparison, this can lead to a condition we call acne. Okay, so that is how all of this is associated with one another. Uh, let's talk about nails. So your nails, I'm, I'm going to be very simple with this, your nails are a tool, okay, and you got to think about the nail in the same way that you think about a hair follicle. Uh, nails and hair are made out of the same substance. Uh, they are made out of... Uh, 
Uh, basically the same thing as your skin, except they have a slightly tweaked version of keratin that we simply call hard keratin. And the hard keratin makes the nail tougher and stick together better. So your nail and your hair and your skin, if you take a sample of all three of those and burn them in a mass spectrometer, they're going to come out and say that they are identical chemically. It's just a mild tweak uh, that makes your nails extra hard and strong, uh, more so than your skin is. Okay, if you look at this, uh, if we could really get a good micrograph, you'd see that it's got a growing area like a stratum basale, and it's got this like stratum corneum area, and like it's the same stuff in there. Okay, it is the same stuff in there. A nail uh, has this deep capillary bed from which everything grows, and it's the same story for a hair. Like if you look at this hair, you can see the little pieces here. These are uh, skin cells basically. And inside of this, what really makes the hair unique is that the hair has a lot of collagen internally, uh, which you can see if you let the hair grow for a long period of time. We oftentimes hear these called split ends. Split ends. Uh, it's simply hard keratin holding this together and the collagen allowing for the flexibility that it sees, more so than a nail would have. Um, yeah. All right, so inside of this, at the base, we find this hair bulb, and it's in the hair bulb that you find melanocytes that give rise to the color of hair. So hair color is driven by um, uh, melanocytes. Now, I'm really going to shoot through this stuff. I don't really think we need to lay around on it too much. So if I'm not talking about it, you probably should just ignore it. Yeah, we have melanocytes to give rise to hair's color. You can actually see them here, melanocytes giving rise to a hair's unique coloration. And what you need to notice is that this is a big capillary bed called the hair papilla. And around this is basically a stratum basale, making this kind of like stratum spinosum. And as the hair grows up, it dries out and becomes tougher, much like a stratum corneum. It's not unlike a nail. It's not unlike your skin. If uh, you've ever seen a nail that's been ripped off somebody's finger, the back end of it is really gooey and loose and soft. If you have ever pulled a hair out deep from its root, uh, you'll see that the, the base of the hair is kind of soft and gooey. That's because these are living cells. These are living cells. And as they grow further and further away from their nutrient supply, they die, they dry, and they harden. Okay. That's why if you yank a hair out deep from its base, you'll see it's larger at the bottom than it is at the top. It's because these cells are alive and they have a lot of fluid in them. And the further up they go, uh, the more dry they get and the more contracted the whole unit becomes. Oh, a very important point to be made here is that of the erector pili muscle. Here is the erector pili muscle. Uh, your erector pili muscles are going to contract to make your hair stand up. Now this doesn't do a whole lot for you, but for like a polar bear or something along those lines, if their hair stands up, it acts like a wetsuit, helps to keep them warm. So other mammals uh, use what we call goosebumps uh, to assist in their maintenance of temperature. All right, I don't want to say a whole lot about burns. So there are first, second, and third degree burns. A first degree burn is when just the upper layers of the epidermis are damaged. A second degree burn is when you go down into the upper dermis, like the papillary layer. And then a third degree burn is burning all the way down into the underlying fat, the hypodermis. Um, and that's really all I want you to know about this. The, the real problem with a, a large body burn is that the skin is no longer capable of preventing fluid loss. So I predict at some stage in your life, you've burned yourself on the hand or something, and it's blistered. I predict at some stage in your life, you've been running and falling down and skint your knee, and it never bled, but it weeped out fluid. All right, one of the things that your skin does is it prevents you from losing fluid. That waterproof layer keeps water in just as well as it keeps water out. And if you burn... <coughs> um, uh, if you burn a large portion of the body... Uh, it's going to be weeping out large quantities of fluid, and that can send you into what's referred to as hypotensive shock. Uh, you can lose so much water so quickly that the blood gets thick and you can have a stroke. It's very, very dangerous stuff, man. Very dangerous. And then, of course, we must talk about skin cancer. So most cancers of the skin are benign. They are uh, not really going to do anything that's going to hurt you. They don't really spread. Uh, what we fear are the metastasizing or spreading cancers. Uh, so what I want from you, this is like public service announcement, I want you to be able to recognize some of these skin cancers so that in the future, if you see it, you can uh, take appropriate action. 
Now, there are three that we will discuss here. These are the basal cell carcinomas, uh, squamous cell carcinomas, and of course melanoma. Um, basal cell carcinomas are super common. Oh man, super common. If you know someone, like an older person, 50s, 60s typically, and they're like, oh, gotta go to the dermatologist and get a skin cancer cut off, they're talking about a basal cell carcinoma in almost every case. This is going to be a little raised area, and it tends to have a bloody divot in the middle. This one's not bloody, but it, it's what it looks like. It's a bloody divot. Uh, they don't, they're not a problem. They're going to hurt. It's going to suck. It's not going to be sightly. It's going to look bad. So what we tend to do is we go to a dermatologist, and they just slice that sucker off, throw a Band-Aid on it, let it heal, call it a day. A good friend of mine lived at the beach all of his life in the 60s, and, uh, man, he, he never wore any kind of sunblock or anything, and now he's going to a dermatologist about every three weeks to get a, a squamous cell, I'm sorry, a basal cell carcinoma cut off. Now, next is squamous cell carcinomas. These do metastasize. They spread. They can be dangerous. Um, what will happen here is, you tend to see these on the lips. Like, this is a lip thing. You see somebody that has, like, a, a scar along their lip, and it looks like an area has been sunken in. That's probably because they had a, a squamous cell carcinoma cut out. Uh, you can see these in other areas, but I, I hear them most of the time on the lips and the ears. They, they do spread. They are capable of metastasizing. So what we tend to do is uh, we'll scoop it out and remove as much as we can. And then if need be, uh, radiation therapy can be used to destroy any other cancerous cells that are there. So uh, these look like kind of like a raised dry patch. can have little bloody bits inside of there as well. And uh, it tends to hurt. They get quite large too. And last but not least are melanomas. So a melanoma, as you can see here, is a cancer of the melanocytes. And uh, when you have melanocyte cancer, they just produce melanin like it's going out of style. So what you get is this kind of raised, completely black spot. Okay? Just, I, what, the way I've heard this before is it's kind of out of nowhere, man. Now, what we tend to use to describe these is called the ABCD rule. Asymmetry, border, irregularity, color, and diameter. Asymmetry. If you look, one side is not like the other. That is asymmetrical. That's a good example of melanoma. Uh, border irregularity. Can you see how it kind of can comes in and goes out? And it's not completely smooth. That's classic sign of of um, melanoma. Color. If it's completely dark or really different from your skin tone and raised, uh, this is a good sign of melanoma. And then last but not least is diameter. What we think of is if it's bigger than the end of a pencil eraser, uh, maybe something to have looked at. So these are very, very, very dangerous. Uh, we cut out large portions of tissue when this is uh, the case, and then probably associate that with further uh, radiation or chemotherapy to get rid of whatever is left. And uh, that's that, folks. So that is uh, a good lecture on the integumentary system, our first system, and we're going to be doing systems from here on out. Uh, luckily, we have gotten through all the introductory materials and we're on to the good stuff. So thanks and have a good day.